Let us welcome Mr. Raymond. Okay, thanks colleagues. We have a small audience this morning. And I thank you for your attention. I don't take it for granted. So I'm glad everybody was able to come. The small number of us who are here. Um, so the title, I try to use provocative titles when I write. I'm unable to write unless I have a title. I have to have a title. The title has to be suitably provocative and have enough word games to reflect my Trinidadianness and my Caribbeanness. Now and again I write something stodgy, but this was one of them. So this title this morning was from Gene Miles, from Gene Miles to 21st Century Management Styles. And it's very opposite. As I was saying to Tony and Lisa earlier on, and to Simoya, my mom passed away on Monday. And tomorrow morning is a funeral. And I felt I had an obligation to do this discussion um, in respect of my mom, the value she gave me, Ursula Raymond was her name. And uh, because she was in convent in the same year and as the same age as Jean Miles, and they were friends, and as the Jean Miles scandal unfolded, I got it live. We didn't have to wait for the papers or the radio or anything like that. So Jean Miles has been part of my growing up as one of Ursula's friends. And of course, there's also another echo because we're dealing with questions of serendipity and synchronicity and irony. There's another echo this morning because we're talking about whistleblowing. That's, the, that's the, 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 the central plank we're talking on. And of course, in this morning's Guardian and this morning's Newsday, the front page story, the main story in the paper, two out of three papers this morning, is of course the report <coughs> into Mr. Darrell Smith, the former minister. People have unkind names for him, and I don't play that kind of sport. Mr. Darrell Smith, member of parliament with Diego Martin, who's the former minister of sport and youth affairs, was removed from office allegedly for sexual harassment. I don't know if it's true, allegedly. Dr. Rowley said recently in an interview on the media, I think he was on 95.5, and he was asked about the report into the allegations against the former minister Smith. And Dr. Rowley explained that he was, they were unable to publish the report Good morning. Because of the um, high scene, they were unable to publish the report because of the question of how it was handled, and the minister, the former minister, had not had the opportunity to put his his story, and therefore to publish it would, would infringe any minister's rights. Well, in fact, that report has been released, no doubt by a whistleblower. You see how interesting it is: serendipity, mm -hmm. synchronicity, and irony. It's been released. So, in fact, the main story today is Newsday on the front page. And the main story in today's Guardian is about, and the headline in both of them is almost the same cover up. And it's um, an absolutely damaging and brutal story. It's about abuse of power in the workplace. Let us be frank. I'm not going to use any vulgar language. It's about abuse of power in the workplace. It's about improper relations. It's about abuse of public funds. It's about a culture of secrecy. And it's about a lot of things that we have to have a discussion about changing if we want our country to progress, and we want to progress personally, because we have to have a culture of consequence. The absence of consequence in our culture is inimical to any kind of development, whether it's personal development, corporate development, national development, regional development. Once you have an absence of consequence as a foundation in a culture or a situation, you can't have progress. It's really simple. I have no island scholarship in it. I have no Latin. I have no Greek. Nobody has to go to Oxford to know that. All of us have children. And even if we don't have biological children, we have younger people that we are responsible for. Perhaps in the workplace. And that's part of what it is we're supposed to communicate. Now, the Gene Miles story, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Gene's story. But I'll talk briefly about Jean because we can't have this talk without touching on her role in anything. Back in the 1960s, Jean was a civil servant. And she worked in the ministry, I think it was industry and mines at the time. Mm -hmm. And the Commission of Inquiry into the Jean Miles allegations, the report was actually published. Very few of them have been published. It's actually been published, I have it. Um, Fully for her, give me a copy. And uh, from which page five is missing. <laughs> for these nice things, I took page five. <laughs> um, uh, the point is that that report is actually very damning. The person 
who had the power to give the license to establish a gas station was the inspector of factories. The inspector of factories at the time was a gentleman called Mr. Tan. And, uh, sorry, Tam. Tam. Tam, T A M, I'm sorry, not Tam, Tam. And uh, he used his power, or he abused his power, which has an echo with the allegations against the former minister. He used his power to grant licenses for particular gas stations and withhold others, and basically he wanted money. So at the moment, what we have in Trinidad and Tobago, apart from some recent gas stations, we have a very peculiar distribution of gas stations. So in a place like Maraval, we have three gas stations almost on top of each other. The first one is at the traffic light at Rapsi Street with all of those corny slogans. <laughs> yeah. You know about the golden rule and the man was the gold making the rule and all that stuff. The next one is on the right hand side opposite Ellerslie. Yeah. Between the tire shop and the Creole Pool place. And the third one, which is now closed now, is on the corner of Anderson Terrace. So there's a kind of tire and battery shop there. But there are three gas stations within stone's throw of each other. And the whole of Cascade and Maraval has no gas station. Because the people who wanted to open gas station in Cascade and Maraval, who had bought land to do so, didn't want to pay my bribe. So we are living now, 60 years later, with the consequences of Mr. Tam. And Mr. Tam was named in the report. And I remember, I didn't know who he was, I just remember the name. And years later, I was doing some work for a client. And uh, he had a big house in the Gomantin, and he minded dogs, him and his wife. His children were big. And he wanted to break down the house and build apartments and get one for himself, one of those kind of development type things that I do. And we had many meetings and discussions, and so himself, myself, and my junior. And uh, what happened at the end is that my mom, in one of her moves, moved into a house down the street, just in Dixon Avenue, Dingo Martin. Mm -hmm. So when you go down Dixon Avenue, it's the first house, the first corner, and you write his house is on the corner. And my mom was going, at the end of the street, back in onto the church of the Nativity, the Emmanuel community, have a kind of home there, mom was staying there. And she said to me one day, so I see a cart. She, she, she's not a kind of person who would ask that question. But she asked me, she said, I see a car at this corner. What are you doing there? So I said, well, in fact, that's a client of ours, because of the thing with the land. And she was like, oh. She said, that is Kenneth Tam. Yeah? That's the man who, who damaged G. And the guy and I ended the relationship soon afterwards. It never happened. I think he might still be alive or something. But G actually reported the wrong way because applications for gas stations where they didn't pay the bribe ended up in a draw. For those of you who wonder, that's how it happens in Trinidad and Tobago when the bribery comes here. They ended up in a draw. And those who paid the money ended up approved and so on. And one of the people who paid a lot of money are call names because it's all in a commission of inquiry report, so they can't do a thing. Okay? One of the people who actually paid a lot of money and received all of the gas station approvals and went on to become tycoons with the food tips. So the gas stations along Park Street belong to the boot tips. And the boot tips went on their own bread and hall and they only built them in Costa Tays and they own a set of property. Their properties in West Morins and they're really tight boots. Neil boot tips and Chamber of Commerce board and all kind of thing. But the father was paying money to Mr. Tam and all that's in the Commission of Inquiry report. It's not Afro Raymond said so. It's in the report. We have to know your country. Okay. The point being, that at that time, there didn't exist a mechanism to defend Jean. So when Jean was doing what she thought was right and proper and reporting the wrong way, she found herself in a very peculiar position. And I say peculiar just out of a sense of propriety. It's not peculiar for a woman who speaks up for the right thing to be accused of a certain type of behavior. That's yeah. not peculiar. I think it's peculiar because it's improper. It's quite usual. Okay? So she was accused of being Bohara and woman. And she liked to dress up. And she would appear in a skimpy bad suit and a whole lot of things that has nothing to do with what she was talking yeah. about. Because the man was taking bribes. It's got nothing to do with it. Maybe she was all and so on, but I don't care. Maybe she used to go and take a sea bath in Maracas and a nice swimsuit. I don't care. The fact is what's taking place was wrong. She, she spoke about it and she found herself on the wrong end of it. So that's why we're blowing procedures, which is what the human resource, when the human resource Concerns come into contact with this. That's why whistleblowing procedures are an important part of this. 
And what's interesting and important about this discussion is that there actually are human, human resource elements that touch on this. And there are whistleblower law proposals before the parliament now. So we need to understand what is the effectiveness of whistleblowing, which I will talk about now. And then we need to have an outline of what are the whistleblowing proposals before the parliament. So we can attach some context. We were going back 60 years to, to Jean and her, 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 her bravery and so forth, okay? And for those of you who are interested, you know, a lot of us learn through culture. There's an excellent play, which I must have seen 15 times, by Tony Hall, called Miss Miles. It appears occasionally in the Caribbean. If anybody has not seen it, go with a friend. Yeah, Carry a young female professional. Carry a young female relative. Yeah. Go to see Miss Miles. It's a one woman play. There's only one person on the stage at all times. See, it's Cecilia Salazar. She's phenomenal. She's a power, strength, all She's little. In Jamaica, they wear this talawa. She's little, but she's well there. It's a phenomenal piece of work. And Tony is on an excellent piece of work. And it's something we all need to see to get in contact with our history and ourselves. So the effectiveness of whistleblowing needs to be understood. It's not just a kind of a coy thing or, a, or something that we're importing. Those of us involved in anti-corruption work or work to improve the management of companies and government and so on. The research has revealed consistently that of all the different methods for detecting fraud and improper practice, whistleblowing is twice as effective. If you run, if you run the methods, in terms of the ones that have impact, whistleblowing is twice as effective as the one that is second round. So in fact, the American Society of Fraud Examiners, which is like a big professional body in the States, in the 2014 annual report, showed that over 40% of the times that they have been going to a company, the police or the auditors, and they hold somebody, and they have to make the charge stick, it's whistleblowing. Because let, let's talk about what that means. As, 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 as we get into the discussion, we go from a thing to the meaning of a thing. You see, anybody can describe a thing. An educated person would describe the meaning of a thing. An educated person would attempt to describe the meaning of a thing. And we're dealing with each other like educated people. The fact is that grand fraud, grand corruption like Mr. Kenneth Tam, and Mr. Putin, Alvin Putin. Hmm. Grand fraud cannot be committed in secrecy. If it's a little fella doing something secret, in like Z and you gave him $200 and he will think for you, there's only you and he went behind the toilet and give any money. But if it's a big thing involving millions of dollars, no matter how smart you think you are, or how you have the thing worked out, there is, there is a trail. There are footprints, there are fingerprints. There is a digital trail. And in fact, there is the possibility, if not the likelihood, if the culture has changed, the management culture, the social culture, the political culture, there is the likelihood that in fact somebody will see it as the wrong thing and they will make sure to try to do the right thing to put the situation down. It could be a sexual harassment allegation, like we discussed earlier with the minister. That is maybe talk about that at the beginning. It could be a financial matter, like the airport, Bianco, and so on. So we have this situation where we get reports because people always know. So you are a permanent secretary, and you are in charge of giving out contracts at the ministry, with bridges and roads and repaving and elections coming next year and things. And I'm a contractor, and I do that kind of stuff. And you and me real good, because of, from the time before, one thing and thing. And I may tell myself that I am calling you and yourself. And from a number where I block number. But if I call between this time and this time, you answer from a block number, and you know it's me. And we have this whole stuff worked out, and we tell ourselves like a fantasy. You know, the things that you tell yourself. Your fantasy that in fact what you're doing is secret. And your secretary will know. Your secretary will know. It's true. It's true. That at five past nine, she has been phoned with somebody, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Thing, you know? 
And my secretary will know. Or my driver. Mm. Well, yeah, well, whenever Mr. Raymond dropped the envelope by thing, she's we get a contract here next week, you know. So we had to go back next week for the thing. The driver, the driver's never will talk here. So we had to go back next week for the thing by the office. And we make the unfounded but natural assumption, because you live in a society where hegemony, hegemonic thinking, is an unstated assumption. We make the unfounded assumption that we are smarter than certain people. So he's your driver. And obviously you're smarter than him, right? Yeah. And she's a lady making tea. And obviously smart. So he goes without saying, really. But it's just not so. Because all of us at some point in our lives, all of us sitting on here, have had menial jobs. My first job was in a hotel just like this, across the room. As a barman at 17 years old. And the people I was dealing with probably thought I was stupid. And we could go on, there's a cycle. But you have to humble yourself and realize that the hegemonic thinking to which we are wedded. Some would say welded. <laughs> the hegemonic thinking to which we are wedded is in fact responsible for a big blind spot. And the blind spot is what the intellectuals call a lacunae. You can do a gap analysis to use the MBA language and use the lacunae to see what is really wrong with all of this. And what is really wrong with all of this is what could put it right, which is what our whistleblowing program does. Because it creates the possibility, if not the likelihood, that somebody will recognize the right thing and be protected, relatively protected, to take steps to put it in right. So that's the importance of whistleblowing and all of this. And I want to discuss now the whistleblowing proposals that are before our parliament. On the 6th of May this year, the UNC um, did not support the PNM's proposals for whistleblowing. And the PNM's proposals for whistleblowing contain a lot of useful points, which I will, I will outline in my talk. Um, I would give it about 8 out of 10 for what would be a perfect whistleblowing law. Um, and I would also say that, like all human things, there's a terrific paradox in the center of it all. Because the same PNM that is putting forward these extremely sound proposals, that's my opinion, I said 8 out of 10, extremely sound and worthwhile, they are also the people who are trying to hunt down the whistleblower with the same dollars with report. Correct? That was the same Faris that they were looking for to find out who. So there's a kind of yeah. black salad, call it a ism and a schism, a kind of thing inside of the head. They want to do the right thing, eh? but they want to find out who told the press about it. Eh? I mean, they must be waiting mad this morning. Eh? If you all see the Guardian and the news, they are <coughs> real bad. Eh? And I'm sure tomorrow the Express will come out with something even bigger, because the Express doesn't have it in today's paper. But it's going to be really bad, because evidently the reporters have beholden. Before it was just little snippets. Like we knew in 150, we knew the woman's name, and we kind of knew there was a case in the industrial court, and we knew that there was a non disclosure. So we had little snippets, clearly from this morning's paper, that we hold to. So it's going to be real all marks. So, the interesting thing now <clears throat> is that we're talking about the whistleblowing proposals before the parliament, and we're talking about the UNC is failure to support it. And quite frankly, I expect the UNC will come around and they will support it. Not because I'm a UNC in secret or in closet or anything like that. Um, because I think that the country needs to come out of where it is. The, the whistleblowing proposals are extremely important. People need to see our country doing the right thing. Let me step back and say a little bit about that without any prejudice to Mr. Watkins, my longtime friend. But let me say that our ambitions recorded in this building, our International Financial Center, which is, you would have heard that phrase, International Financial Center, with about 10, 12, 15 years they're talking about it, Mr. Manning was alive and so on. That is literally not going down. Let me be very blunt with you, it's not going down. I say it like how I see it. If I'm wrong, I don't mind coming and apologizing. But our country is so conflicted about these things, so it's a religious country. 99.9% .9 of the people in the country are worshipful and faithful. They all believe in something. They worship regularly. We have more laws probably than anywhere else on the planet. The amount of laws you have in this small country. And we never hold anybody. So we had a financial, we have a country that is this big. That's how big the country is. We're this big. We had a financial crisis that was this big. And to put it in proportion, 
America's financial crisis, one you always hear about Wall Street, that was 1% of their GDP. The cost of that bailout. out. Our own is 13%. We don't even understand the numbers. Our own is this big, in a country this small. Everybody knew who was on the board of Clico and who was here, and nobody's been arrested. And we want to have an international financial crisis, and nobody's coming here. Nobody's coming. Until you had a whole people. And I mean serious people, eh? not no junior under. A senior serious people have to get home and put in jail for people to start thinking about Trinidad and Tobago that way. Because the international banks, the kind of banks that they're trying to encourage to come here, they are people who research these things. And they're not taking any basket, they will do proper research. And they're not coming here to prejudice their reputation for no good reason. The whistleblowing proposals at the table by the government are very, very interesting. So let's talk about them. And they've got some fascinating features. The first feature that I was absolutely stunned by is that when we're talking about whistleblowing, we tend to think, because we started talking about Gene Miles with the inspector factories, we mentioned Clico with the regulator, and the, uh, Minister Smith with the allegations about sexual harassment and so on. And the discussion has really had a kind of a color looking at government agencies or state agencies. The first big thing about the whistleblowing laws that are being proposed in this country is that they actually create whistleblowing protections and they encourage whistleblowing in public and private organizations. So that's the first big thing to understand. So don't think because you work in BP or you work in a private company sitting down in this meeting, it's got nothing to do with you. It has got to do with you. You regardless of the fact whether you're not in government. That's irrelevant. The law that is being proposed in this country is affects public and private organizations. The first important thing. The second thing, which is really interesting, <coughs> is that in fact, they actually identify two species of whistleblowers and treat with them differently. And this is where it gets really fascinating. So the first species, is somebody who's actually involved in the thing, whatever the thing was. So there might have been some cooking up the accounts, to some corrupt contracts or something. But the person, the person on the, the first species is actually involved in the crime, in the improper behavior. And for some reason, a flash of conscience, somebody get them vexed, a jilted lover kind of thing. They didn't get their cut of the money, whatever. For some reason, they decided to, to turn state evidence and to make a report about something that they were involved in all the time. So that's the first thing. Interestingly enough, the law and the current attorney general actually recognize how important it is to encourage somebody who's involved in the crime. Hello. And they created two big things to encourage them. The first one is that they've allowed the court to mitigate a sentence of someone who assists the investigators. So you could actually be involved in something. The details don't matter. The, the, the guilty as hell. The sentence for that could be seven years. But because you have the police and you told the police where everything was, and yes, this bank account was in Samoa Royal Bank, and you tell everything and everybody, the court could actually properly, under the whistleblowing law, that's proposed by the current government, give you time of your sentence to say, well, listen, this lady really helped us. Samoa helped us a lot. It was more good. So in fact, we gave it a year and a half. But she was already inside the thing, so she could go home now. So the court, <laughs> the court was actually allowed to, to, to have that kind of consideration to encourage somebody who's in the middle of a conspiracy to come forward. Very interesting. The second thing that the law creates for the person who's in the middle of the participant in the crime is that they can actually be paid a reward which is actually a whole huge fertile discussion outside the scope of this discussion. Because that, that we don't have time for that. The whole person of self-funded anti-corruption agencies and the role of rewards and things like that, a whole other thing. So there are two substantial encouragements to people who are in conspiracies to do the right thing. The second species of whistleblower is where I have a problem and I, my, I frown my brow and I go like, what were they thinking? And the second species is somebody who's merely an observer. So you work in any place, you're not in anything. They never ask you to be in anything. Those people don't like you, you don't like them, whatever. But you could, you could as I say, you could make them out. 
You could make out that this is happening, that is happening, that is happening, that is happening, that is happening. That is happening. And you make a report. So you don't sign anything, you're not part of anything, but you make a report because you believe what's happening is wrong. And in that case, the law actually talks about they don't want to take any steps to encourage anybody to be whistleblowing and seeking an, a reward, which I find to be real peculiar. Given that the person who was in the crime could get a lower sentence and a reward. And the person who was merely an observer doing the right thing, the law he says that in fact we don't want to make, make any rewards to those people. So I believe that's a, that's a definite lacuna. Definitely something to be looked at okay, and corrected, maybe revised. The other thing that I used to have a problem with, and I'll give it to you all as something to look out for, is the way that these whistleblower things are written. Generally speaking, they are written to prohibit a, the disclosure of the whistleblower's identity, so you protect the person's confidentiality, and B, there's a list of things that you might call retaliatory actions, so demotion, dismissal, disciplinary action, yes, uh, physical abuse, um, deducting their salary, different things that you could take to punish somebody once you as a boss get to realize that that was the person who. So in fact, those things are prohibited under the law, and there's a long list of them. But the one thing that's always missing, and new proposals have addressed that, well, I mentioned it to you all because things have a way of slipping in and slipping out, and who knows the UNC could ask for that to be taken out for their support. There's a whole, there's a whole dog and pony thing up there. Um, and that is really to do with the question of lawsuits. Because if you are looking at normal whistleblowing proposals, like the one in the procurement law, or I think the Integrity Commission Act also contains a whistleblowing clause. They actually talk about things that you're not allowed to do to whistleblowers, but they're silent on the question of lawsuits. So in a, in a litigious society like ours, you could have a situation where you make a report that the contractor with the roads and the bridges is paying a bribe to receive contracts. The contractor gets a final it's you. Who knows how? Everybody has a friend. Contractor get a fine is you. And next thing you know, they launch a lawsuit on you for damaging their good name. Yeah, it happens all the time. So you have all kinds of people suing each other in the papers all the time yeah. um, because of their good name and so on and so forth. And the court supporting it. So you could find yourself as a relatively medium level or junior level person in an organization being pressured by a lawsuit by somebody who has plenty of money. And they can let go two lawyers' letters and a writ to have you in worries. And in fact, in fact, penalize you have they made a report. So it's, it's, it's encouraging to me that the 2018 draft of the whistleblower protection bill includes a prohibition against that. But I'm also saying as a cautionary note for you all, as a question of information and how these things go, I'm also saying to you that in fact, part of how the political horse trading goes you can say, all right, well, you know, we we'll vote for it. But you have to take all this, take all that, take all that. That's what it happens, yeah? There was a philosopher who said that, in fact, two things that you should never actually see close up are um, how, how it's actually made. It's how sausage is made and how laws are made. When you get close up, it's really, really, really grim. Eh? What comes off the table, what goes on the table. And it literally sometimes don't make any sense. Eh? Somebody who's been really close to it. Let me give some, some down home examples before we wrap up. And some contemporary examples. And the example I would give, the, the, best, the best contemporary example I would give is from about a year ago last year, the 19th of October, where the terrific floods. You know, Green Bay and all that stuff, yeah? Central and so on, serious floods. And the government put in place to show you the kind of propensity for, for trickery that is part of our national curse. The government of the day put in place a program to assist people who, whose homes had been damaged and their belongings had been damaged by the, by the sudden flooding. It was very serious. And I forget the amounts, but let's say the amount was, if it was one person alone, so if it was you alone living in your house, you might get $15,000. 
And if you were living in the house with your husband and four children, you got thirty thousand dollars. So they didn't get into any big calculation about the number of children. They just said, if it's one person alone, fifteen thousand, a family, twice that amount. So they made the grant available to one of the ministries. And and two things happened. That's really terrible. Number one is that um, people inside the ministry recognizing the haste with which the arrangement had been put together and the political necessity of satisfying those claims for hardship. They constructed claims. So they had friends and family from who in areas that weren't flooded. And they would get their friends who already come in with the ID and make a check for them. And a lot of things went on. So, so that's one part that's truly nasty because they really helped themselves. And the other part that was truly nasty is there are people who actually were flooded who still haven't been able to get any money mm -hmm. because they always have to come back with the next piece of paper. Mm -hmm. When no, this DP, this name is different, you have to get a deep poll and a whole, you know, the civil service, how they could be where they want to be. But what's encouraging about it is that I heard Dr. Rowley speaking maybe two or three months after, it might have been about January or February of this year, he was speaking at some political meeting somewhere. And he was speaking about that whole thing that I just outlined. And he was making the point that out of $122 million that they had paid out, because a lot of money was paid out, the ministry had paid out $122 million of public money in, in flood, flood relief is what they called it. I think about maybe 45% of it was probably long time. Like people, who, when, they, when they went back and they looked, and you get a DP number, these people weren't even living in the area. But of course, they don't collect the money and go on. And they are charged about six people in the ministry and they before the courts. But the lesson in all of this, because it's not just a story I'm telling you, is that none of that would have been possible without always have Because somebody in the ministry realized, wait, now there's a real stupidness going on here, boy. And made a report with names and And that's how six people were charged. And that's how it's been. But they stopped the program, which is how things were going on. They Peter Paper Paul. They stopped the program, so people who didn't get their check, they're not going to get any because they stopped the program. So, so this wrongdoing actually is a multi-million dollar thing. If processes are not in place to secure proper outcomes, this is what will happen. People will make a road, you know, could you make an attractor run on, they will make a road to help themselves. Uh, whistleblowing is an important part of um, of putting an organization on the right tracks, so not only public sector organizations, private sector organizations. I mean, the example I would give from private sector organizations is the whole Enron, Enron thing. So we go back to the hegemonic thinking, which I was criticizing. I made a remark about hegemonic thinking. I was criticizing it a few minutes ago. And we go back to hegemonic thinking and the perils of hegemonic thinking. And of course, the book, the classic book on the Enron meltdown, which of course destroyed the world's leading consulting firm, which was called Arthur Anderson. The firm no longer exists. But the leading consulting firm in the whole planet, and one of the leading energy and engineering firms in the world, Enron, both of them were destroyed. And in fact, the book on it, the title of, the title of which I can't forget, but the author of which I've forgotten, the book on it, the classic book on it, is called The Smartest Man in the Room. The name of the book. Because they say they were so, they were such. Now we're trying to be able to be a smart man. They were such intelligent people. Because Enron used to recruit for decades the top people at top universities. So they just hired the 10 brightest people out of Harvard, the 10 brightest people out of Yale. That's the kind of company it was. So the, any, man, any meeting they went to, any seminar they went to, conferences, anything like this, and they get up to talk. Whenever somebody from Enron started to talk, within about two minutes, everybody's looking at each other and realize this guy is the smartest person in the room, boy. But they were criminals, they were utter criminals. So there's a, there's a real danger in hegemonic thinking. We're thinking that we can't be wrong, and we can't put things right. Um, humble people can put things right. Uh, we know that from our own history, as, as people of color, coming out of where we came out of. The people who did us wickedness, they thought they were right. And of course, we now know that that's not so. Today is um, the 31st of October. And uh, I want to thank you for your attention. You've been very kind. And um, I have rambled a bit. Thank you. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. I don't know how long.
I don't know how long I spoke for, but um, <laughs> I could have gone more. Yeah, yeah. We get some more. Too. Yeah. I have two questions after. Sure, sir. Um, you talked about the good thing about the law yes. that is being put in place, yes. which is not um, only for government and that kind it's of thing. Public and private. private. Public and private. Correct, yeah. But does there have to be a law? For an organization, whether in the private sector, state enterprise, well, you know, or any sector that you're in, to, to for your whistleblowing policy to be supported. In, in other words, yes, if that never pass, um, if an organization decides to develop its own whistleblowing policy, you know, do you think it will be strengthened by having the support of a national law? on it, or it doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't matter? I think it matters. Um, I think law matters, because at the end of the day, what we have is a situation where, in the absence of a law, somebody can be dismissed, mm -hmm. disciplined, demoted, punished in some kind of way. Someone who's trying to do the right thing could be punished <coughs> in some kind of way. And apart from the fact that it's fundamentally immoral and unethical, mm -hmm. There's also the fact in, in management terms, if we remove ourselves from the moral universe and we just look at it in management terms, there's also the fact that what you are doing, you're giving rise in the ranks of the company to the notion that nothing matters. You know? Okay. So in Trinidad and Tobago, our national slogan is, um, I think it's discipline, tolerance, and production. That's what I heard. <laughs> and, um, my good friend Denise Deming and I, my, my good friend Denise Deming and I play this game. We become with three word alternatives in national slogan. So one of them is my favorite is everything is everything. Okay. Um, uh, her own is like you get through. Okay. Um, another one she likes is I try something, and we play this kind of game with each other when we see each other, because really. How true is it? But the point I'm getting to here, in terms of in terms of answering Lisa's question, is that really, if you have a company where the culture is one, where somebody can do anything, say anything, and get away with anything, one has a real question: What is the future for that company? Okay, in a society that is becoming increasingly critical. Okay, people are becoming more judgmental. And uh, things that didn't matter 10 or 15 years ago are, are all of, of high importance now. So look at the situation going on with that company right now. Just to name two big engineering companies that are in crisis. One of them is, um, I think it was Volkswagen with the diesel thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And all these. Yes. Yes. And what's happening with Boeing now and their share price? Yeah. So they had an airline, and the airline had a problem, and they play with the software, and then the thing, and then they went down. You see, you always now being pressed, and he said, well, yeah, he really knew, you know. He really knew. People were flying, they came out again. And that is now, that's where it's not at the time for them, because Mr. Ross is going to tumble out of the closet in Boeing, and talk about, they really knew. Mm -hmm. Because they're going back to the thing about you thinking you're so smart, that you're the only one who controls the narrative. Those days are over. So the point I'm making, Lisa, is that in terms of promoting healthy outcomes, and healthy philosophical <laughs> positions, is that the law is important because it will prevent the punishment of whistleblowers from being merely a lamentable thing and convert the punishment of whistleblowers to being a criminal act mm -hmm. with consequences. Um, I'm not hopeless. There are some people who are hopeless about our society. Say, but you know the law in Trinidad is never enforced, and what do you really think will happen when I'm not open? It's um, all a question of perspective. The fact that we're standing here, having come through the kind of middle passage and the Calipani and all the places we came through to come here, we, um, we are proof that the negative is not necessary and is not eternal. We are proof of that. Okay. So I'm a, I have very aspirational thinking. I believe change is necessary. Um, uh, change is possible. We have to, we have to vision, visualize it and fight for it. You know? Sure. I'm getting a signal from the lady. You like him? 
No, no, yeah. sorry, to one else. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, think, I think I signal. So if there's anything else, I'm happy to answer more questions. But, yeah. Anthony? Let, let me yes. just, just play something. It's sort of three pops that I have on this thing. Sure. And I'm going to wait to three, because I already knew what it is. I hear the issue of character, mm -hmm. which is an individual issue. Yes. I hear the issue of culture, what we believe, what we let pass, practices. Mm -hmm. And I hear the issue of constructs, mm -hmm. policies, systems, mm -hmm. yes. or protection, mm -hmm. processes, yes. and the mechanics of the thing. Uh, as you look at those, where do we? Tackle, tackle this, this, this thing. Like that. You know, I mean, we don't ask everybody to be good. Okay, and that, that's at the character end of it. We know that's not going to happen. Yeah. The, the other things, how do you see those kind of lining up and what might be our best point of entry to, to address some of our issues that we experience? Well, I mean, I think we have to have an episodic approach to the thing. And uh, by that I mean, and I mean, it sounds a little opportunistic. By that I mean, uh, for example, this morning's story is a Darren Smith story with the allegation, <coughs> the reporters and the press and so on. And we really need to, 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 to bring about our wit and to say that, in fact, the Prime Minister must be relieved. Because last week he was telling us he couldn't publish it. <laughs> this week it's been published and it wasn't him. So we can discuss it now, okay? So are you putting Dallas back into command in next year? And we need to be able to put pointed questions to advance our civilization. Are you putting him back? Yes or no? Is he putting him back? And don't tell me about any committee and things because all you have the power to say, hey, what, you're not going back. Those people have the power. Oh, hey, what? You're a good boy, you know. Come and see me next week because so. so. We need to be putting those questions. If $150,000 of our money was spent to settle those allegations, which is what the reports that we've had so far say, I think that's wrong. I don't think public money should be used to satisfy allegations of that kind. And somebody has to pay back that money. And I don't mean no mysterious somebody, Dallas Smith and the PS, whoever she is. And in fact, interestingly enough, let me show you how the thing is tied together, because you have to get in detail, in, in, in minutiae. Natasha Barrow is a woman's name, who was PS in sport mm -hmm. when the check was written on the whole agreement and the non disclosure and thing and thing. Where's Natasha Barrow now? Hear how interesting it is. The woman who was PS in the Ministry of the Energy and Legal Affairs was somebody with a Japanese something kind of name. Forget her name, no, Jami, and that, that Jali or something. So she and I had, had, had engaged with each other on one of the things I'm doing, one of my lawsuits. I never met the person. I don't know what she looks like. Very good engagement. Very professional. She, was, she came forward with information. She helped me. She gave me this stuff. I understand about a month after she helped me, she was removed suddenly. She had to say, you had nice strategy. So what the help she gave me allowed me to prevail in the litigation I was doing against the state. She was removed. They can't fire up, yes, of course. But she was assigned to one of the, let me be blunt, one of the no, one of nothing ministries. There are ministries that are something, and there are ministries that are nothing. So she's put in a nothing ministry. I forget which one. It doesn't matter. It's not one of the big ones. Natasha Barrow was taken out of sport, and she's now the PS in the Ministry of the AG and Legal Affairs. So you see how it's, it's a terrific wheel, eh? Mm -hmm. So that, that gentleman, Faris, his peers, as I'm standing here this morning, is the lady. Who organized the thing with Dallas Smith and he did not disclose any agreement, any 150 and all that stuff. So it's actually going to be a terrific and interesting story. But we're not going to be able to advance the story because I don't believe the stories can advance in the short term purely through um, philosophical and religious and spiritual entreaties. People need to have a case. You need to see, see something. You need to put a face to the case to say, all right, I don't want that person going back. And I want this person to pay back the money. It has to be like that for us to get like what, what is going for a world example. Mm -hmm. Of course, philosophically, over a long time, you absorb things and you forget, you give up bad habits and you take new habits and so on. And so, on. so that's my attempt to answer the question. So, in fact, Natasha Barrow is an interesting part of the story. I, I don't know her either. But she's an interesting part of the story. I don't know how she has fitted into the whole 
what really went on. The papers are right about that yet. The, the, the consults, the responses, the yeah. actions around an episode. Yes. Over yes. time, we yes. to shape the culture. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I think I have one other question. Sure, sure. Again, not more fundamental, it's philosophical. Okay. What constitutes a crime? Now, whistleblowing is the reporting of a crime. So I am thinking mm -hmm. something that may not be financial impropriety or sex. You know, those are the two things that could come up before us. But there may be a lot of immoral or unethical things, wrongdoing in an organization. I, I want to know if, they, if that has been dealt with. What, what constitutes that? Uh, is, it, is it a crime that has to be committed or perpetuated that will, that a whistleblower will, will, will um, blow the whistle on? Well, I think it's crimes. The way the law oh, is, is okay. really aimed at crimes. crimes. Um, okay. Because you see, what you've got, to, what you've got to be careful of, let's, let's talk about that. Because I happen to believe, <coughs> I am, I'm a black man, I happen to believe that political correctness which is all the rage now, has actually got the potential to deny us mm -hmm. our um, intellectual range mm -hmm. and our ability to discuss issues and so on. And this is not an attempt to throw cold water on political correctness because, of course, nobody wants to go down to pejorative name-calling and all that stuff mm -hmm. from long time or now. But political correctness is a serious thing. So you could get to a situation where Somebody can't be invited to speak at a university. Um, why? Because they have more than one wife. Or somebody can't be invited, somebody like my mother, can't be invited to speak at a university because they have children and more than one man. What is it, son? Sometimes it's utter foolishness. The person could have something to say that's important, even if you don't agree. Okay? So, the question of legislating personal views, which is what you decided to mm -hmm. yes, touch on to that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. The question of legislating personal views is actually something that has to be treated with very sensitively. Because you could end up in a situation where really valid viewpoints don't form part of the record anymore. And we also need to be careful of the fact that there's another phenomenon. There's another different things operating in the same space. Eh? So at one level, in fact, I had it in my notes eh, that I sent to Maxine on this earlier on. It didn't form part of my notes this morning. But at one level, yeah, at one level, we have the question of political correctness, which is what we just talked about. Mm -hmm. At another level, we have the notion of false equivalence. So the false equivalence poison could emerge in a situation where somebody could be allowed to speak and say absolutely toxic, false things mm -hmm. under the basis, the mistaken assumption that they have a point of view too. Okay. They have something to say as well, and so on and so on. I think that we really need to be to stick within the law. Mm -hmm. And even, even where we recognize, as people with our particular history, that the law itself is unsatisfactory and needs to evolve as we go forward. And he was going to his part of that. Yeah. So we'll leave it there for now. I think yeah. they're giving me a frantic signal at the back. Yeah. 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 They don't want to be disrespectful. Yes, sir. Thanks.